as Christians, we are called to on a journey of faith. There are difficulties to be encountered, problems to be faced, but with courage and God's help, we will arrive at our destination. Good morning to you all, brothers and sisters. We want to thank God that we are here today, worshipping him in our different places, wherever we are. And I really appreciate that you continue to support us in listening to our messages and also showing interest in what God is doing in our lives and in our lives. May God bless you. Let us pray. Spirit of life, creator of all, with the heart and voice we love and joy, we offer you our worship and our praise. Truly have been a good God to us. You have revealed yourself in Jesus Christ and fulfilled your promises by the Holy Spirit. You have accompanied us on each step of our journey. As we move on our daily basis, we know that you are there. Lord our God, save us from sinister, insinuating snakes, free us from food fairs, and temper our techniques. Help us to work together when times are tough. Laring around rather than reeling off. Realizing rather than leaving. Praising, not protesting. Help us to confront our fears and difficulties. Lord, so that we can wander beyond the wilderness into the promised land. Bless us, Father. In your name I pray. Amen. I will call upon Brother Ben to come and do the reading of the word of God. From Numbers chapter 21, verses um, 4 to 9, then the book of John chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Thank you. Good morning and another beautiful day. Uh, hope you all had a wonderful week and everything's going well. And your families are all going well as, as well. Uh, as Johnson mentioned, two scripture readings, and I'll start with the first one from Numbers 21, 4 to 9. That's about the bronze snake. They travelled from Mount Hor along the route to the Red Sea to go around Edom, but the people grew impatient on the way. They spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us out of, up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread, there is no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent venomous snakes among them. They bit the people, and many, many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take the snakes away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. The Lord said to Moses, Make a snake and put it on, up on a pole. Anyone who is bitten can look at, and look at it and live. So Moses made a bronze snake and put it up on a pole. Then when anyone who was bitten by the snake and looked at the bronze snake, they lived. The second reading today is from John chapter 3. And it is 14 to 21. So just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because, of their, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed but whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God yeah pretty amazing pretty amazing that 
to keep our eyes upon Jesus is so powerful. All right, we'll um, get Johnson back to share his message on this this week, and uh, I can't wait. I hope you're looking forward to it as well. I'm back again. I've come up with a theme, look up and live. One day I was driving to the next town that is Mariba, and I saw this sign where people are doing uh, road works, and it says, look up and live. So today I, I've taken that theme and used it in my message, look up and live. Do you like snakes? Not men do. No other creature on the face of the planet so universally brings forth a sense of revulsion and disgust. True or not, we think of snakes as ick, slim, nasty, and as our text reminds us, dangerous. For me, I hate snakes. If you to, to tell me about snakes, I can face a lion but not a snake. It seems that the children of Israel in the midst of their wilderness wandering after the escape from slavery in Egypt. It is tumbled on to a location south of the Dead Sea that is informers for its leather or snakes. Big deal, they no doubt thought. Why should we expect anything different? This trip has been one big fiasco from beginning to end. Fiasco perhaps, adventure, absolutely. You can read all about this extended hike in the book of Numbers. In fact, the Hebrew uh, Bible titles the book more accurately, In the Wilderness. The narrative begins about a year after the Exodus. So God tells Moses to take a census of the people, to determine the number, that's the number of the book in our Bible, of men available for combat should necessary arise. Then following about 10 chapters of further instruction, they set out for the promised land. As we know, it did not take long for the gripping and grumbling to start. Some time back they had begun their diet of manna, those small round grains or flakes which appeared around the Israelites, came each morning. So the name may have come from the question the Israelites asked when they faced them, what is it, manna? But now those cakes were getting old, how about some meat? Moses, you, Egypt may not have been perfect, but at least we had some fish every morning, every time, not to mention the cucumbers, the watermelons, leeks and onions, and even garlic. Give us some meat, meat to eat right now, some meat, we need meat. These were not happy cucumbers. Poor Moses, God said that some help would be forthcoming. Seventy men should be set aside to assist not only that meat was on the way. Well, God says you will not eat meat for just one day or two days or five days, ten or twenty days, but for a whole month. Until it comes out of your nostrils and you lose it. Numbers 11, verse 19 and 20. So they, they are here. So the wilderness, wandering continues. They arrived at the border of Canaan and were instructed to send in a spy team for a 40-day reconnaissance run. Twelve men, one representing each tribe of Israel. You remember the result from the Sunday school, the report of a land flowing with milk and honey. We have been always told about it, the land that flows with milk and honey. And to prove it, they had brought back a bunch of grapes that were so huge that it took two of them to carry. But the populace made the grapes also huge. Two of the twelve spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, So what? Let's go. But the ten others said, No way they would not turn us into dog meat. So we cannot go. We cannot continue with the journey. Again, the weeping and wailing and whining starts. If one who had died in Egypt, on this desert, why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Would it be better for us to go back to Egypt? In Numbers 14, verse 2 to 3. So, 
Then they wanted to choose a new leader to replace Moses because Moses was no longer the leader they were thinking of. Someone who would take them back to the Pharaoh. Joshua and Caleb tried to calm the crowd with new assurance of coming victory, but folks wanted to stone them into silence. You can see the people Moses was dealing with. By now, God is getting steamed. Once more, Moses intercedes on the people on, on his behalf, calms God down and extracts a promise that they will not be wiped out. But there would be a price. The wilderness wandering would continue for 40 years worth one year for each of the 40 days the spies were in the land. And the only men of Israel now alive and over the age of 20 who had finally lived in the promised land would be Joshua and Caleb. Because they were the only two who had enough faith to believe that their God would give them victory. As you well know, the story does not end there. There would be some more grumbling and grousing. One outright mutual against Moses' leadership ended up costing the lives of almost 15,000 people in a plan. So there are complaints about not enough water, so God arranged for Moses to be able to strike a rock with the staff and bring forth enough water for them to drink. Now the end of the long journey is near. And they have encamped in desert region that is informers for the snakes. So the gripping and mourning resume. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? So you can see these people, they are always complaining. For there is no food, no water, and we chase this miserable food. In verse 5 of uh, Numbers 21. For God, this is about the last straw. Their venomous tongues would be repaid in kind with more venom the people began to die because of what they were doing so they come to Moses they finally admit that they have done wrong we have sinned when we spoke against the Lord and against you Moses ah all the 12 state program tell us that the only way to correct a problem is to recognize that you have a problem so they agree that their mouths have gotten them into this trouble now Moses, please, 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 please pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. Please, we beg you. Moses, do something. So he does. Moses intercedes in prayer. Gets this strange instruction about making a bronze image of serpent and hanging it on a pole in the center of the camp. Then he is to inform the people that anyone who is beaten will survive if he or she will just cast their eyes towards this snake. That was strange. They asked him to remove, they asked God to remove the snakes, but God did not remove the snakes. He gave them another remedy. Anyone who looks at the snake will be healed. Why not just get rid of the snakes? <laughs> Was this God's way of saying that healing will not come until we recognize the disease? Perhaps so, the prescription was given, look and live. Look up and live. And he did. And the grumbling finally stopped, at least for these people. One might wish that this encounter in the desert with the serious venom would have marked the absolute end of venomous complaining and criticizing among God's people. But we know it not. It goes on all the time. They always criticize God. They always complain. Even to this day, despite the fact that it does no one any good. Even today, people complain in the church. Someone has not a Jesus who turn water into wine, but he is never able to turn wine into anything. It remains like that. Some years ago, an insightful watcher of the church by the name Mike Yoconnell wrote an article called The Tyrion of Trivia. Some of his observations reminded me of an ancient desert wanderers as well as our situation. Listen, the problem with the church is not corruption. It is not institutionalization. No, the problem is far more serious than something like the minister running away with the organist. The problem is pettiness. Blatant pettiness. Visit any local church board meeting and you will be immediately shocked by the sheer abundance of pettiness. The flower committee chairperson has decided to quit because someone didn't check with her before they put the flowers on the altar last Sunday. So you can see the pettiness people deal with. 
The chairman of the board is angry because the meeting was held without his knowledge. One of the elders is upset with the youth director because the youth director wants to take the church youth group to a secular rock concert. The kitchen's committee is up in arms because of the last youth group meeting, which was mushroomed from 15 to 90 kids in six months. The kids took some sugar from the kitchen. The janitor is threatening to quit because the youth group played a game on the grass over the weekend. And now the loan needs extra work. Can you see the things people focus? They focus on things which are really nothing. I can understand each and every one of us graphs mentioned above. I also understand that the same general argument is always made for each one of these graphs. If you don't have order, you have chaos. It sounds like a little thing, but everyone was allowed to do, think what that would mean. In other words, churches are so preoccupied with petty they can't spend the time required to do what really matters. So I'd like to say that what people in church leadership are apparently having a difficult time saying today, there is no excuse for pettiness in the church. People should come to that point of saying no pettiness in the church. Pettiness should have no place at all in any church for any reason. Petty people are ugly people. They are people who have lost their vision. There are people who have turned their eyes away from what matters and focus instead on what doesn't matter. Sometimes you might need snakes. There is a story of three men who live on a ranch out. The father, John, and his son, Jack and John. They never had any use for the church until one day Jack is bitten by a rattlesnake. So the doctor is summoned by the prognosis is not good. Jack is going to die. So the young son is sent to bring the preacher. When he arrives, this person asks to offer a prayer for Jack. And this is how he prayed. Oh, Father God, we give you things that you have sent this snake to bite Jack. It is brought him to seek you. We ask, Lord, that you would send another snake to bite Joe. And a really big one to bite the old man. So that they too might come to seek you. We thank you for your providence and ask that you send us bigger and better rattlesnake. Amen. <laughs> I think sometimes we need those snakes to do some <laughs> help us to rethink who we are. Asian Israelites needed the snakes. Yes, they focused on the brass serpent when they were supposed to and found healing. But as the years were on, that brass serpent became an idol to which the people brought sacrifices. Finally, the practice became so outrageous that King Ezekiel smite the thing to pieces in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4. It is easy to focus, to lose focus. But in the gospel, John takes the gross incident and tells us, and Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So much the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. That is John 3, verse 14 and 15. What does that mean? Listen. <clears throat> the serpent itself was a symbol of sin. Christ was made to sin for us. We might made free from sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. So what does this story now, Numbers and John 3, come together? Undoubtedly, this connection between the Old and the New Testament is the most important insight in our biblical readings for this Sunday. In the Old Testament, the snake is lifted up. In the New Testament, Christ is lifted up. Can you see these two things? Lift up the cross. There's something gross about that. It's just that we have put so much gold plating around it and hang it around so many necks as decoration. That is no longer looks or sounds offensive. I suspect this is one of the reasons the empty cross has placed the crucifix so many in of our churches. We don't want to see when we and even be reminded of the suffering and dying. Christ was nailed to it. But it was a lowly Jewish carpenter who was ex executed on such a cross as a common criminal. Yes, the chief symbol of our church today, the cross was an electric 
chain of the first century. It was used for that. So the great missionary Paul saw the cross as a scandal to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles because it was hard for them to accept a suffering redeemer, a wounded healer. So they and I, we are more comfortable with the God of power and majesty. But what we have is a carpenter son from the little town of Nazareth, one who came humble and meek, whose life ended high upon the case tree. This is the person we are talking about. Yes. The story in front of us this morning is strange to our ears. But strange or not, our story continues to reveal a God who is faithful and consistent. In the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, through all the mourning and complaining of the cold ones, God remained faithful to the agreement, that is to the promise, that was made with them. God always remained faithful. So for the children of Israel, the wilderness was that time between God's deliverance from Egypt and their entry into the promised land. So in our life, the wilderness is that same time between the dying and rising of Christ when Christ come again. So we are now on our wilderness journey. Every day we are moving in the wilderness waiting for Christ come. We are in the wilderness. We live in, in between time. In our wilderness trip, we have to have our snakes with which to contend. Snakes that poison our lives. We also do our share of grounding and complaining. Yes, we live in our wilderness too. Only the geography is different. Wherever you are, it's totally different from where I am. So lift up high the cross. Look up this cross and see there's a sign of our healing. The sign of salvation. Among other things, the cross is a great symbol of God's continuing faithfulness to us. This God who refused to give up on the Israelites of old will not give upon us the baptized ones of the present. You will continue to look after us. Yes, look up and live. That's my theme. Let us remind that our God knows that living can be hard and our suffering can be great. Our God in Christ has experienced wilderness living. God has appreciation and understanding of our feeble attempt to live and love in a wilderness full of snakes. He knows, but that is where we are. So look up the cross. The uplifted cross proclaims to us that God's love for us is not based on our success. Our social standing, our bank account, our prestige, not even our great average at school. The cross is and remains the symbol of God's great and unconditional love for us. So when we look up, we find life. So lift it high the cross so they, your Redeemer know that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. I know that a lot of people only know John 3 verse 16, but they don't know John 14 and 15, which talks about looking up. So we need to look up. That is a good lesson for the church. Keep the focus. Look and live. And to remember how contagious that sort of thing is. Look up and everyone else wants to look up with you. What a witness. The main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. The main thing is to look up at Christ. Not on pettiness things. So God is, is loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now that God asks you to do, my friend, is to look up and live. <laughs> only that. So look to Christ. He is taking you place there. You, you are a sinner. Christ is taking my place on, on the cross. I am a sinner. And it is you who deserve to die. It is me who deserve to die. Christ did not deserve to die. He died for you and me. If you are not looking up Christ, I don't care how many times you have been baptized. How many ceremonies you have been through. How many churches you have joined. Or who your father and mother happen to be, you are a lost, hell doomed sinner if you don't look at Christ. You must look to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is just as simple as that. It doesn't matter your position that you hold in the church, 
Your position that you hold in the country, in the world, it doesn't matter. And by the way, it is just as complicated as that. What a problem have today, people have today, they would rather look at themselves. They would rather look to themselves and to their own good works and trusting that somehow their good, own good works might save them. <coughs> Your good works never save you. It is a problem for people to admit that they are sinners and to look to Christ and trust in Christ. The moment we know that we are sinners, we need to look at Christ. What does it say? The song says, Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look fully in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strange and calm in the light of his glory and grace. So I'm urging you, brothers and sisters, to look up at the cross of Jesus Christ and you live. Surrender everything. Look up. You find your salvation there. Don't trust in your own power. Don't trust in your own knowledge. Don't trust in anything rather than Jesus Christ. May the good Lord help you. May the good Lord bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. We know that we come to you sometimes this gen has got a lot of things. This gen of faith is one of contrast. It has got mountain tops, clear vision, a wonderful sense of your presence, valleys of shadow, confused thinking, feelings of loneliness. In the ordinary days of living, forgive us, Lord, for our failure to celebrate the glory. Forgive us, Lord, for our lack of faith and trust. Forgive us, Lord, for taking you for granted. You are God. And we come to you right now. Father God, you cried us in your everlasting arms and you hold us safe amid all that would harm us. Gentle, as with your wounded hands. Soothe our fevered anxieties. Free us from the fear that the journey to fullness of life will be too hard. And increase us the knowledge that we are profoundly loved. Keep us looking up at your son Jesus Christ. Opening his arms to us on the cross. Take from all that harms us in body, mind, and spirit, and give us all the healing that we need. For his sake, who died for us and lives in us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now I take our offering. We need to take our offerings and remember that what we are doing with these offerings is just thanking God what God has done to our lives. I know God has been doing great things in your life. You may not have given testimonies, but I know that you've got a testimony about what God has done. So because of what God has done in your life, you always come and say thank you. Thanksgiving is always important. Whenever you have received something, you always say thank you. So you might, not have, <clears throat> you might not have even evaluated to find out what God has done in your life. But just the simple gift that you are alive is a good thing to say thank you. So please, come with me together as we pray for our offerings. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these offerings. We thank you that you continue to look after us. We thank you that you provide us with life. We thank you that you provide us with all necessary things. We thank you that right now we've got the vaccine that is coming in our way so that it can help a lot of people who were made facing death. Father, we pray that maybe as we look closely to our lives and evaluate what you've done, we'll always remember to thank you. 
May you bless this offering, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. Heavenly Father, we come to you from this place in peace. Go from this place with love. As they've received from God, so give and be to others. In Jesus' name. May God be your vision and Christ be your pattern. May the Spirit be your energy. And may you know the blessing of God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Stay in peace, remain in peace. God loves you.